In the United States, more than one quarter of all energy consumption occurs in transportation, and this sector illustrates the conflicting priorities of energy policy. Transportation is reliant on petroleum fuels, which fluctuate in cost, and supplies of these fuels are finite and scattered across the globe. Greenhouse gas emissions from their combustion contribute to the problem of climate change, but alternatives can be limited and expensive. It's up to policymakers to find the right balance between affordability, reliability, and sustainability in transportation. One emerging option is biofuels. Biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel are alternatives to liquid fossil fuels that can be produced throughout the U.S., providing a net positive domestic energy source with economic benefits for producers. They also have the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, but this benefit is often disputed. The positive environmental gains from biofuels are realized when life cycle impacts are taken into account. A new kind of policy known as a low carbon fuel standard does consider life cycle fuel impacts. But the life cycle emissions from biofuels can vary significantly depending on numerous factors and, for some biofuel pathways, may equal or exceed emissions from petroleum fuels. Policies like low carbon fuel standards are being developed to address America's energy challenges and opportunities but their life cycle accounting may limit some biofuels in the list of potential fuel options. Hi, my name is Horacio. And I'm Keith, and we're going to talk about the effect of life cycle assessment of biofuels on low carbon fuel policies. To begin, what exactly is life cycle assessment? Life cycle assessment, LCA, is the study of a product or service throughout its lifespan from beginning to disposal, uh, tracking the environmental impacts of the production, use, and disposal of the product. The boundary is the line you draw around your product where you say everything within this line, this boundary, or this box, I will take into account in my life cycle assessment, and everything outside of it, I will not. Allocation is a methodology, a procedure for giving co-products or things that are not the primary purpose of the process, other products, some sort of value to the overall life cycle assessment. How are greenhouse gas emissions regulated in the U.S.? One method is direct combustion, or simply what comes out of the tailpipe. Using this measurement doesn't include carbon uptake through photosynthesis that takes place when biofuel feedstock like corn is growing. Including this carbon uptake is the main environmental advantage of biofuels because it can offset emissions from combustion in emissions calculations, decreasing life cycle emissions from the entire biofuel pathway, making it less polluting than petroleum fuels. But life cycle emissions from biofuels aren't always less than those from petroleum fuels. In fact, you're probably aware that different sources in the scientific and political communities report different results for life cycle biofuels impacts. But what's the cause of these differences? Ethanol can be made out of a lot of things, and chemically the resulting ethanol, no matter what it was made out of, is chemically identical. But the life cycle assessments of all these different things would be very different because you start with the production of the feedstock, so the production of corn grain is very different than the production of switchgrass or trees or potato. For example, with uh, corn grain ethanol or ethanol production in general, you start with the feedstock. What aspects of the agricultural production of the feedstock should you take into account? Should you take into account the fertilizers? Should you take into account the production of the fertilizers and the transportation of the fertilizer to the farm? Should you take into account the production of the machinery used on the farm? Of greatest uncertainty, definitely where you draw the system boundaries, where, what you decide to include and what you don't. Data sources and assumptions. Allocation strategy is a huge factor that causes variability. There is no one-size-fits-all LCA. Each one is different from the other along the whole life cycle. The results of LCA studies are used by policymakers to inform policy. But with so much variability and uncertainty, some biofuels can end up looking like a less attractive fuel option. This is the case in low carbon fuel standards. A low carbon fuel standard, or LCFS, is a regulatory policy aimed at reducing emissions from transportation 
by evaluating the life cycle carbon intensity of transportation fuel pathways. Carbon intensity is a measure of a fuel's greenhouse gas emission and the emissions include not only the products at combustion but all of the greenhouse gas emissions that occur upstream throughout the fuel's life cycle. And the units convention for carbon intensity is grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per megajoule of fuel. A fuel pathway describes the life cycle of a fuel from its basic origins to its combustion, commonly called well to wheel. So in the example of corn ethanol, the fuel pathway would include uh, all of the raw materials and equipment required to grow corn. Uh, it would require the, it would include the shipment of feedstock to the corn ethanol refinery, the refining of the corn to the grain ethanol, and then the transport of that grain ethanol to market, and then ultimately the combustion of that ethanol uh, in a vehicle engine. A low carbon fuel standard caps the total carbon intensity of the collective fuel pathways utilized in the policy region. And over time, this cap is gradually lowered. This policy combines top-down regulation with market attributes by allowing fuel producers to trade credits if they lead or lag the carbon intensity standard in a particular year, which according to LCFS supporters is an advantage over a purely market cap and trade or carbon tax system. CARB established 11 different fuel pathways for corn ethanol, each representing different production options. For each corn ethanol pathway, CARB assigns two carbon intensity values. The first is from direct emissions, which result from processes directly related to the production and combustion of ethanol. The second is from indirect emissions, which basically accounts for land use change. So land use change is the conversion of land to agricultural production. Uh, and it's very important for a low carbon fuel standard because the clearing of the land and the tilling of the land results in a uh, very large initial release of greenhouse gas emissions. So a direct land use change would be the conversion of land to agricultural production for the purpose of growing a biofuel feedstock. An indirect land use change is a little bit uh, more complex. In that case, we're concerned about the global markets for agricultural products. So for example, uh, in response to a biofuel incentive, a farmer may switch from growing soybeans to corn. Um, as a result of many farmers making that conversion, there's less supply of soybeans and more demand for soybeans. So as a result, somewhere in the world, someone is likely to convert some amount of land to uh, make up for that increased demand for soybeans. And even though those soybeans aren't being used directly for fuel, they're indirectly the result of that biofuel incentive. As a result of including these emissions in the carbon intensity of corn ethanol, CAR was sued by the Renewable Fuels Association, a trade organization that promotes ethanol. In the case of California standard, they are looking at future scenarios for agricultural production as they would change to account for their low carbon fuel standard. They're taking the change in the emissions resulting from the indirect land use changes and then taking the average of those changes and applying it to their fuels. The fact that it is a, a complex uh, process that they're trying to uh, capture and consolidate down to a, a single number and that's to make it easier basically to implement the regulation. The initial role of life cycle assessment is to inform policies about, for example, renewable fuels, to help inform um, incentive programs. I think life cycle assessment for things like biofuels needs to be a case-by-case -case basis. That way, you reward companies that take the extra step to try to bring down their overall carbon footprint. We have seen how LCA is affecting the development of carbon policies in the U.S especially the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Carbon policy development will depend on other technical findings, values, perceptions, and priorities established to benefit societies. It is up to policymakers to articulate these broader objectives in order to achieve comprehensive environmental goals.